Hello and welcome back to the Shepherd's Crook Podcast. Hope you guys are all doing well today. A few announcements just to make you aware of what's going on. Oh, my phone just went off. Let me turn my phone down. I mean, that's basic podcasting one-on-one, right? Turn your phone down. <laughs> So I need to let you know of our YouTube page. If you don't know, I had put all my videos on Gab TV. Gab TV went away. And so I started a YouTube channel. If you like following along and watching rather than just listening, you can jump over to the YouTube channel and subscribe. I'll leave a link to the show notes or link in the show notes to that. Also, just want to keep reminding you about the Sons and Slaves podcast. Me and my boys are having a blast just working through the boyhood and process of becoming a man, just having some really good conversations. This week, we're actually going to record with a young boy from our church named Noah who went out in the woods with a BB gun and shot a squirrel, his very first squirrel. So we're going to talk about that with him. He skinned it and ate it on the same day. So that's the kind of content that you can look forward to if you check out that podcast. And uh, certainly hope you do that. If you want to become a member of the Shepherd's Crook, you can do that as well. Just reach out to me and we will get you on the list. All right. I'm talking to a friend and a brother. A man that's in a pastoral candidacy program at our church, and I've known now for, I don't know, three or four years. I'm talking to Paul Rim. Paul, what's going on, man? Hey, how much? Glad to to be here. (laughs) Yeah, man. Glad to have you. Let's go ahead and pray. And you've kind of got a little bit of a unique story, so we're going to hear it and have some fun along the way. All right. Father, we just thank you for friendship. I thank you for Paul and for Hillary and their children and all you're doing in their life. pray for blessing upon this conversation. I'm just uh, looking forward to having, having fun talking. I pray that those that are listening in would be encouraged and challenged as well. And uh, thank you for all our church family to listen. And for those that are out there in the internet world that are listening as well. And uh, God blessing upon them in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm doing the backwards hat for the first time on video here today, Paul. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Looks good. Um, Bring us up to speed then because everybody at our church, kind of like with Ben last week or two weeks ago now when this finally airs. Tell us who you are and tell us about your family and then what you do. Okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Paul Rem. Uh, I've been married to Hillary for going to be 15 years, September 6th. So that's coming up. I uh, have a have an 11-year-old daughter, 7-year-old son, uh, Ariadne and Kai. Um, I work uh, for like a government contractor, third-party contractor for Medicare. It's a very very boring job. Uh, I, I audit other analysts, make sure that they're processing applications correctly. So it gives me a lot of time to listen to podcasts and <laughs> uh, teaching and stuff, which we'll probably get into that. But, <laughs> but so uh, do you ever have to fill out TPS reports? <laughs> <no>. <laughs> I know that reference though. So. Okay, good. good I was hoping man. you did. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about that. I was reading that chapter today, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. You're you're actually in your home office. So you don't go into a cubicle or into an office, so that's good. But right. you're just talking about it. You get to work whenever you want. So, I mean, you could, if you wanted to, you mm-hmm. could get up really early, knock it out eight hours a day, whenever you want, yep. which is pretty cool. Yeah, I wish I was more of a morning person. I could get it knocked out earlier, but. <laughs> Dude, I, I have to say, my... I'm telling you, <laughs> ideal hours, Brandon's hours are four in the morning, basically till noon or till like, yeah about noon something like that sometimes we'll get off a little bit earlier but i love that i mean that schedule is just that's awesome (laughs) but the flexibility i think that kind of flexibility most people are wanting i mean you kind of have a pretty cool gig Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i'd like it if i could get up that early but yeah (laughs) (laughs) kind of a night owl well you've been at the church now uh three we just recently talked about this but i forgot two years or three years Uh, i think it's going on on three years uh, December 2020, I think. Okay. Does that sound right? Yeah. It was right you. before probably was born. So, okay. Yep. So that would have been uh, in December of, of that year because Providence was December the 17th. So right in that time range. Okay. You yeah. were kind of creeping on the church for a little while and I always saw you on the Facebook Q and a stuff, but you had just recently a year, I don't know how long before you'd, you'd left the church you were part of. And then you were connected at another church for a little bit and then ended up landing with us. But really, I mean, I, I you have a keen eye for just theology in general and are able to think through and process, especially Trinitarian theology, really well because of your unique, unique background. So I'd like to kind of back up a little bit. And if you just kind of tell us your church background and then also when we get in, 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 uh, into where you are now, I'd kind of like to reflect a little bit and say, OK, what were some even though there were uniquenesses to how you were 
uh, brought up in the churches you're a part of, like there's probably still some really good things. Um, and I'd kind of mm-hmm. like to hear those things as well. So kind of bring us to where you are today back, you know, biographically from where you started. Sure. Yeah. So it's kind of a long story. Uh, I'll try to condense it as much as I can, but uh, I've been born and raised in uh, the United Pentecostal Church International, which is um, a oneness Pentecostal organization. Uh, another name for that would be Jesus Onlyists. Uh, they believe only in baptism in Jesus' name only. They believe any other baptism would be invalid. Um, in order to be saved under that church, we would have to be baptized, obviously, in Jesus' name, and then also speak in tongues, uh, receiving the Holy Ghost. So I, I grew up in that, uh, was a youth pastor for a few years at the last Pentecostal church I was involved with, which uh, the first Pentecostal church I was, uh, my grandfather was a pastor of, so okay. I, I was in it until my 20s. And then uh, one of the guys I had grown up with, he, he became pastor of a church in Ziegler, and we kind of just followed him uh, to that church. But uh, long story short, uh, I was reading the Bible a lot. I started to notice a lot of uh, what I would say would be legalistic aspects to the doctrine. And that was kind of the first, uh, the first domino to fall was it the seemed, legalistic aspect. Uh-huh. Let me interject a thought real quick. One of the things I've noticed is a lot of people that leave the UPC, it seems like that is kind of the first domino. It's not necessarily the Trinitarian mm-hmm. theology that may come later, but, yeah. or the oneness theology that really they, they started to, to recognize was an error, but it seems like the legalism is kind of the first thing that people recognize. Yeah, very, very much so, because even after I left, I was. I held on to that oneness doctrine for a very long time. Okay. But uh, but the very first thing, like I said, was the legalistic aspect. And there was just things that I could not reconcile with scripture, the things that they would do, uh, like the uncut hair, the skirts for the women, beards for men. Like they were very strongly against that, which they've kind of leaned, they've kind of calmed down with that uh, lately <laughs> in re- recent, recent years. But that was kind of the first domino to fall. Uh, we started going to like a home church hybrid thing that had started out of a friend's home who had also come out of the UPC. Okay. Kind of the same thing. He had noticed some legalistic issues and uh, it was kind of our, we, we call it our therapy uh, to get out, to get out of that. And we were kind of just healing from all the, from all the wounds that we had, we had had. Uh, now Hillary lost- was there when you guys got married, but was Hillary at the church you grew up at? Cause she, she didn't grow up in that in the same way you did no it's very interesting when i met hillary she was agnostic uh she grew up in in the church of christ which is kind of the opposite spectrum they're not into the spiritual stuff at all uh speaking in tongues is all that's all demonic um but she grew up in that there were people that went to her church growing up that refused to come to our wedding because that's just how uh at odds they were with each other with the doctrine they just viewed us as the crazy people mm-hmm. uh, but but w- when we met uh i kind of started witnessing to her you know i was we obviously started dating a, missionary as, as dating man. with an agnostic girl yeah i know <laughs> it's not it's not recommended for everyone i know but it, it worked out you know there's a lot of <laughs> praise god that I there. <laughs> uh, but kind of witnessed to her and she became saved as well under that theology you know and, and i i do believe that god was working even though it was such an erroneous and in some aspects heretical doctrine i do believe that god was working with me and with hillary in Mm -hmm. in that but but yeah we got married under that uh started going to the ziggler church uh shortly became youth pastors after that um and it's kind of a dual thing the way they did it uh we taught the youth uh, the teenagers uh, which i love that um but it, it, it was in dealing a lot with the youth that it kind of solidified where I was seeing some legalistic doctrine that I just could not pass on to these youth. I mean, we would get some really bizarre questions about, you know, what if there's an old woman on her deathbed at a nursing home and she's not wearing a skirt, what happens to her? And it's like nothing, you know, that's not, that's not a biblical, that's not a biblical category. Right. Uh, But kind of, kind of just woke up from that, uh, went to this hybrid church for a little while quickly became leaders there and i realized that you know i just want to sit somewhere and learn 
because it was very, very close to what I had grown up in. It just kind of dropped the legalistic aspects of it. And mm -hmm. it was basically starting a new church. Uh, this church is actually still active today, but uh, it was in the very, very, there was like a handful of us, okay. very, very early starts of it. But so we just, after that, we came out of that, didn't know where to go, uh, did a lot of online church because we just didn't, I didn't know where to go. I didn't trust anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, just listened to a lot of Driscoll for a while. Yeah. You know, ironically, <laughs> way before I came to Reformed Theology was listening uh -huh. to Driscoll. Uh, and then there was a local, uh, a local mega church that had, had a lot of Pentecostal leanings. So we kind of got connected with some people there and there were some people that I had grown up with that had now gone to that church, had okay. the same background as me, found out the pastor and his wife also had the same background as me. So it was just kind of an easy transition into that. And, uh, from there we were there for about five or six years. I became their main drummer, um, just for a long time and <laughs> it, it was there where kind of everything shifted mm -hmm. um trying to think where to go well, from here let me just again a lot just, that it, happened let me interject the, the thought again go ahead. because for, for those that are listening and that know paul you know that this church that he was a part of that he was a drummer of it's a large church i mean it's a very large church it was a significant deal to be the drummer there one of the main drummers there and there was just a ton of people it sounds like it was, kind of, it was that church is kind of like a, a a oneness incognito a little bit or even pentecostal incognito a yeah. little bit i don't want to oh very much know. so yeah it, it is because and that's what made it easy they mm -hmm. allow trinitarian doctrine there it's one of those things that they allow both at mm -hmm. but they don't divide over it it's not something that they take a stand on like yes we're trinitarian or yes we're oneness it's like eh, whatever you know we don't we don't divide over that it's okay so they're not but saying you, that that's you die without was, a skirt on you're yeah. going to hell you know Right. And and that, that's another thing that I loved about it, because all the legalistic aspects were gone, but I could still hold to this Pentecostal doctrine, the oneness theology that I held to. I could still hold on to that and still be a part of this growing, thriving church with this awesome music. And I get to be the drummer. And mm -hmm. so so that's kind of kind of where we landed there. Uh, so I guess near the end of it, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, connections to like prosperity gospel, okay. uh, word of faith. You know, if, anybody who knows about the Pentecostal doctrine knows a lot of that is intertwined. They might be against like the more extreme forms of, of the, um, but the, our daughter, Yadni, which, you know, so here I am, I'm serving the church. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing everything that they're telling me I'm supposed to be doing, read my Bible, I'm praying, you know, I was very much into, you know, going and soaking uh, in my living room at night and just kind of just praying until I get into the spirit, you know, just very, very emotional, ecstatic. And I was doing all that. I was doing everything I was supposed to be doing. I was fasting for crazy amounts of boom, my daughter gets uh, hit with type one diabetes. So that really just kind of put, put a fork in the road for me. And I, I kept it quiet for a very long time. You know, I was, uh, I started just realizing, okay, something's not right. Something that I've been taught is not, it's not playing out the way I've been told it's supposed to play out. This kind of stuff is not supposed to happen to, to someone like me who's trying to do everything right and live right. So I started listening to just all these podcasts. I, anybody that had Christian label on it, I was listening to it. I was listening to a lot of progressive stuff uh, like bad Christian podcast. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Very progressive. They're even worse now than they were back then. Uh, but toyed with the idea of open theism because, you know, I thought God can control what happened to my daughter, you know, and here she is with type one diabetes. God must not be in as much control as I thought. Hmm. Uh, start looking into that a little bit, realize that that doesn't reconcile with the Bible either. So that's, there's something wrong with that. Um, hmm. So then, uh, and amongst all of that, I, I I realized that you know the progressive way is obviously not the way to go, uh, and I start I all of a sudden got a distraction. A couple things there there was a lot of things that were happening that were catalysts to this. So uh, I was being confronted with eschatology okay. uh, on one aspect. 
uh, hyper charismatic theology and how like how Bethel, like, I don't know if you guys remember the the whole def- defecting from Bethel uh, mm-hmm. podcast came out with Coltish. Yeah. That came out around this time. Um, and then I was confronted, like I said, with preterism, that eschatology. And uh, it all just kind of came to a head. And I started, I started calling out like all these like elevation, Bethel at, at SIWC, which we play all of those songs on a weekly so basis so it's you're, like you're I'm calling really it out on facebook is that what you're calling it here. out um yeah so you're calling you were calling it out on facebook well I'm, I'm talking to our leaders it's like hey guys okay. i just listened to this not, not really not really facebook so much i was talking more to like uh, the worship pastor and the and the, also the uh the pastor's wife you know hey i listened to this podcast you know there's some really scary stuff i'm learning about bethel and i had some other you know, I won't get into this, like hyper charismatic prayer meetings that really had some scary <laughs> moments um, happen. And it kind of caused me to be a little fearful from anything of that. Not so much fearful as just like, I could see that this is more like a new age Hindu um, fake version of the Holy Spirit that's going mm-hmm. on here. So there was right. aspects of that that I was running into and seeing that we were heavily connected to a lot of that. So, so here I am trying to reconcile, okay, there's some charismatic Pentecostal theology that's really not taught in the Bible. And it's, it's hyper spiritualism. It's uh, a lot of tied to the new age and just basically re retreads of, you know, Hinduism, basically Uh, Kundalini spiritual experiences, you know, manifesting um so i was running into that but uh, i came to a distraction of of eschatology where i was there's a friend uh that started going into eschatology online and it was uh, involving preterism so I was like this guy's nuts uh <laughs> i'm gonna have to debunk this so I, I, it's like i found a distraction in the midst of all this and like i'm just gonna debunk this guy and show that what he's teaching is wrong uh that this is not biblical so I started looking into it myself, and at the end of the line, I was like, I can't poke a hole in what he's saying, hmm. you know, and I, just there was like this light bulb that went off with with the study of hermeneutics and uh, rightly uh, interpreting scripture in, in, in full context. And there was all these things that I was seeing in scripture that I had never seen before. Hmm. Uh, I ended up adopting preterism. You know, I didn't even know a post-millennialism, amillennialism. I didn't know that. I just knew, okay, what, what is being talked about in Matthew 24 that happened in 70 AD. You know, I started putting all these historical documents together and stuff that I had never been taught growing up. And I was like, wow, wow you know, this is, this is the way it's, this is the truth, you know, and being able to be taught through that, rightly interpreting scripture and looking at context and historical elements of it. I I was starting to follow other people that taught this theology, this eschatology. And one of the first theologians that I fell upon was R.C. Sproul. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'm like, if he's right about this, what else is he right about? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and all in the midst of this studying this, I, I came to the point where there were some things that happened at, at the mega church. Um, trying not to name drop, but I probably already did accidentally. But I, I don't think we have uh, yet. I don't think we have. There, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, some things that happened and they started getting involved with the Enneagram. I won't go again to that, but it's very, very bad. Stay away from that. And, and that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back because they were very dispensa- dispensationally premillennial. And here, here I am adopting this new eschatology, and it's like, I, I just can't, I can't deal with this anymore. I was up, you know, I'd be up there playing the drums, rolling my eyes when they've been taught, when they, they'll talk about like the Antichrist or something okay. like that. And <laughs> even my parents were like, you got to watch your facial expressions while you're up there because you're on camera, you're on the big screen sometimes. And here I am playing the drums going, oh gosh, this is so <laughs> stupid. Um, oh, but... <laughs> But in that, I, I, we finally we decided to leave. We resigned. That was, you know, crushing because this has been our church family for the past five, six years. Right. Uh, and tough. it just you can never leave a church and leave it well. 
uh, no matter your intentions, wanting to leave it well, you know, it, it, you're pretty much written off a lot. Uh, so it was, you know, that was an upsetting hurdle that we had to go through. So in the midst of that, I was still learning from, from like R.C. Sproul. And through him and through Coltish with the defecting of Bethel, I, I started getting on to James White, you know, because he's very connected to Apologia. And he wasn't even at Apologia at the time. Um, he just had his Alpha and Omega ministry. He started listening to him. And I was like, whoa, this guy's really, really Calvinist. Um, I don't like Calvinism. <laughs> but all these guys that I'm learning from are Calvinists. And I'm like, what's going on here? So it was it was probably a two, three year process of just kind of going through. Uh, and I just kind of set it in my mind. And it, like, I'm going to take everything that I've ever been taught about the Bible, everything I've ever been taught about Christianity, and I'm just going to set it aside and just go back and go back to basics. And I'm just going to learn the Bible for myself. And wherever I land is where I land. And throughout this two, three year process, I, I ended up, you know, Calvinist, which I never thought would happen. Uh, I, I kind of was aware of you and aware of the circles uh, that you ran in back in the day. And I just remember thinking, oh, yeah, Jared Sparks, he's that crazy Calvinist that works over <laughs> at that other church in Marion. Um, I just didn't trust. I didn't trust that at all. Um but I, I ended up, to my shock, coming to all this. And, and I think Limited Atonement was probably the last domino to fall with that. And when that finally fell, I, I just kind of slowly walked into our bedroom like, Hillary, I don't know how to say this, but I think I'm a Calvinist. And she's like, really? And I was like, yeah, read this. And I started going through Romans 9. And it was like, however, she's like, yeah, that makes total sense. You know? And uh <laughs> And we totally, I totally skipped over the, you know, within all this, I, I, I came, I was still holding on to this one is theology, but within all my studying of this, and like I said, the looking at the Bible in context and seeing all, all these scriptures just open to me that I just kind of mentally blocked out. I, I came to the Trinitar the Trinity, uh, in this, in this whole, <laughs> this whole process. And I'll tell you, the James White was one of the biggest ones that uh, kind of dropped that ball for me because I, I watched mm -hmm. a lot of debates. Um, like I said, I work from home, so I can I can listen to a lot of stuff while I'm while I'm just plugging away on the computer. So I was listening to a lot of debates with him on on oneness theology, and I was also reading the holiness of God at the same time and reading the Forgotten Trinity. You know, you know every everybody who comes to the Reformed faith knows that. You read a lot and you just read as much as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, you're basically just relearning everything. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I was coming, I was reading this and I was listening to these debates and I'll never forget. I was, I was actually still at the office. This was before they sent us all home after COVID. Uh, I was in the office listening to this debate between James White and a oneness Pentecostal. And when it clicked, it was like this, I had to excuse myself I'm crying right there oh, in my wow. cubicle because I'm like, Oh my gosh, God is, is so much higher than us. He is infinitely higher so much so that he can dwell in this Trinitarian union with himself. You know, he's one being, but he can exist as three persons. And that was, that was such a mind blowing and uh, what felt like a second um salvation moment almost mm -hmm. because or conversion moment because i just i had never viewed i felt i felt like i had never viewed god rightly and when that hit me it was just so overwhelmingly emotional i had to excuse myself so nobody was like well, what's, what's going <laughs> what's, on what's up with that guy? Die? you know <laughs> yeah because I, I was like i said i was just sitting right there at my desk and just like oh my gosh the trinity is true and everything i've ever believed has been a lie about god so, so that was all happening in the process of me coming to reform theology and uh, like any other person that comes to Calvinism, you, you know, you go through that cage stage uh, mm -hmm. and I knew, and I didn't realize while I was kind of burning all these bridges after, <laughs> after leaving our church, uh, that that's what I was going through. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, there was one night where I was watching a documentary on Calvinism because, you know, the L still hadn't dropped. So I was like, why hasn't it? Um, 
so I was watching it and they started talking about cage saves. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I've been going through the past two years. And that's why I'm just, that's false. That's false. You're a false teacher. You know, I was just like <laughs> blasting people online. It was ridiculous. You know, and, and they really, that really is true. When you go through this, you should yeah. sit in a cage for like three months, to even like a couple of years and just not talk to anybody. Just slowly <laughs> learn about theology and then you can talk to people. <laughs> um, but it was very, it was very bad. You know, even Hillary would say, she's like, you were unbearable when you were going through that. <laughs> it was so bad, but well, I know that was kind of hectic the way I described it, but love it. Love it though. That's so, kind of, that's kind of how I came. To it. Yeah, man, that's uh that's a fascinating story. I love it. There's a couple questions that I have, you know, I've talked to you about this before, but I think it would be helpful for people who are listening because there are some who have gone through, you know, theological shifts and changes like you have, and those can be pretty cat cataclysmic in your life. They can turn a life upside down, really. And especially if there's a lot of dominoes that fall at the same time, it can almost feel like, you know, that's why I think a lot of people run to that progressivism as well, because they they realize, wait a minute, what I've learned isn't mm -hmm. right. And then they feel like they're on, you know, shifting sand and they run, they just, they just run and don't ever actually land. They question everything, but don't actually land at the truth. And so you're married. You guys have been married at this point for, for 12, 13, 14 years, something like that, up to that point. And you said, is this your 15th anniversary, you said, coming up? Mm -hmm. Okay. So for Hillary, yeah, yeah, how, did you, how did you navigate this with her? Because at the same time, you know, I'm sure that there were some probably challenges even when your theology is changing in your marriage. So it's been really neat to see Hil Hillary has, I mean, followed you all these years so how did how did those conversations happen yeah and you know how would you encourage guys that are in that situation or maybe in that situation as well yeah you know hillary's always been really awesome when it comes to this because she'll she often would notice something was wrong before i would i tend to be loyal to to a fault so even when i would notice even way back in in the upc when i would notice things that were wrong I'd be like, you know, this is eventually going to correct itself. I'm just going to, I'm just going to hold on. Okay. And she was kind of, she was kind of ready way before I was. Um, but even when it came to uh, like when we left the mega church, she, she was ready long before I was uh, noticed a lot, a lot of, a lot of issues before then it wasn't so much doctrinal, but she just noticed that there was some issues um, just kind of with the way that they dealt with people um dealt with worship and and you know the hyper charismatic stuff uh to to us to a degree um but after we came after i kind of talked to it and after i was silently going through all this existential crisis uh, when it came to the trinity she was like yeah you know i always believed that and i was like why didn't you tell me that's huge because you know in the upc that is just no you do not affirm the trinity that's heretical in, mm -hmm. in that circle she was like yeah, I never kind of, I never understood the oneness thing. I mean, look at Jesus's baptism. I was like, what? <laughs> uh, so, so that was really easy. Um, but it, it, even when I came into, you know, reform theology, you know, I just kind of read it to her slowly. And she was like, yeah, you know, that sound, that sounds, that sounds right. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's go, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, Praise God. Uh, yeah, it was, it was very easy. I know a lot of people don't have that. Mm -hmm. that uh blessing <laughs> that god was just kind of bringing her along with me yeah very, um without any conflict without any controversy without us fighting you know the only thing we fought about is my cage stage and how i was just blasting everybody <laughs> chill you know, out, i was horrible chill out, Paul. <laughs> uh, yeah and that's what it was it was like you need to calm down you can't bring this up every time you're with somebody and i would like i, I would always try to drive the conversation to like a false theology that I knew the other person might affirm just, mm -hmm. just to get them, yeah. you know? So it well, was pretty bad. That's awesome to hear. And I think, you know, I've said before, but I wish everything in the Bible was as clear as Romans nine, because it's unbelievably clear. The problem is it just can be difficult. It's hard. And I think these distinctions, yeah. the, you know, theological categories, people can get confused because they think that something that is hard is unclear. And I think it's important when we're having these discussions and even people that might, might be listening in like, Oh, Paul, Paul, I used to go to church with Paul. Listen to what he has to say. 
Well, the scriptures really are clear and make sure that you're not just writing something off as difficult to understand or confusing, or people can just have different perspectives on this when something is so plain and clear and, you know, read Romans nine and believe it. I think with the rest of the scriptures as well, people get, you know, a lot of times get confused because they just reject the clarity of scripture. And if we can just say, here's what it says. Yes, there are some passages that can be difficult to understand, but the beauty of what you're talking about is you're not just saying, you know, Hillary, you've got to love R.C. Sproul and you got to love James White. and You got to love whatever it's here's the scriptures. What do you think about this? And then she's like, yeah, I mean, that sounds sounds right to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is, which is yeah. Awesome. Uh, it, yeah, it was so awesome. I was so worried. Like, I was scared to bring it up. Like, when it, yeah, I was like, I don't think she's going to she's going to follow me here. And then this is going to cause all this conflict. She's like, no. Yeah, right. I'm right <laughs> on board with you. Awesome. Well, we had we went through that because when we got married, we had some differences as well. We we grew up in different kinds of churches and both grew up in charismatic churches. Jordan and I did. And but in 2007, I had become a Calvinist. And then when we met in 2009, you know, I still was pretty cage stagey. I mean, a couple of years of that. And I had this reputation that you had heard about first, you know, in Southern Illinois. Yeah. It's not like we have a huge region. And I think there's still probably people out there that think I'm pretty crazy. And, uh, <laughs> um, but it was, you get this passion, you know, for God's word and you're just, this God's grace is just so overwhelming. And for Jordan and I, we got married and then God just had to work and unite us. And within a year, God brought tremendous unity for us, but those differences can be pretty cataclysmic where it can feel terrifying. What if I tell people I believe in the doctrine of election, you know, like, oh my goodness, what are they going to think? Or can mm -hmm. I even believe that I believe in the doctrine of election? When I first heard it, I just revolted against it. And, uh, and the fact that, you know, yeah, God's faithful. And the fact that God yeah. maintained unity in your marriage, that's awesome. Praise God. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I can definitely see his providence. <laughs> yeah. So looking back then, what are some, you know, sounds like there was a, a lot of, I, I, in your church experience anyways, there was a lot of negative. Was there anything that was good? Anything that you look back on? You're like, God, thank you for that. Thank you for those seasons. Thank you for the people that love me. Or what was it, was there seasons then you, that you're thankful for? As you look back and say, okay, that was good. Um, and if not, that's fine too. But I'm just wondering, because I, I think with all of us, it's easy when we pendulum swing to look back and then kind of categorize everything we experienced growing up as negative and then miss some of the, the good things that were there. And I, I certainly did that at our church yeah. that I grew, I grew up in for a while, where I just kind of put it all in this big basket and said, that's bad. And then after a few years, you're able to like look inside that basket again and say, you know, there's a lot of really good things in there. There was a lot of good things that I got to experience. And so I don't know if that's the case with you, but w what are some things that you, you think, well, that, that was, God, thank you for that. That was, that was good. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you would ask me the same question a few years ago, it would have been a very negative answer. But uh, I can't, I can see uh, um, uh oh, I can see you there that there was Paul. a love of God's word. Let's see, hey, yeah, can you hear me? You there? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Hey, can you just, hear me? Yeah, you cut out. Just start over and say, "I oh. can see," and then you went silent. I'll make it seamless oh, in the sorry. audio. No big deal. Okay. Um, I can see where God gave me a love for the Bible, you know, just kind of his word and, and learning about him. And I think, I think that is probably what caused me to be, to eventually become at odds with that theology one day, you know, the very thing that was poured into me, this love for God's word. Yeah. Um, I was a Bible quizzer at one point. So they would memorize like these entire chapters of the Bible and then they would compete against other churches. Um, so a, a, a lot of that, and then community, you know, there was, there, there's a very tight knit community. You know, you can say a lot of things for the UPC, you know, heretical one, the doctrine, whatever, but they know how to do community, right. You know, mm -hmm. very, very close knit, you know, all those people that I grew up with in the church, you know, they were in my wedding. I was in theirs. Uh, just very, they, they really are like family and, mm -hmm. and coming out of that into like a mega church setting, you do lose a lot of that community because in a crowd of like 2000 people, you can kind of disappear, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with regards to the next kind of the next level church I went to, um, <laughs> I'm a little closer to that. So it's harder to, <laughs> to find the positive, yeah. um, because a, a lot of the negative is what led me to, you know, reform theology and, 
<sighs> it, it, that's kind of hard. Yeah. I, I did flourish musically there. Um, I will say this, the musicians I played with are the best in the world. Really, um, man. They they really were. I mean, the worship pastor at the time had a couple of double wards in his office. I mean, it's just amazing musicians, you know, and, and, and they really loved what they did. So it, it was fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I was really close with, with those people. Um, as far as that, that's probably, probably all I can say with, that's, with regards that, to that. That's the lessons. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> what are some things that, you know, looking back now, how would you have counseled yourself, you know, going through that process? If you, if you now could sit down with Paul in 2000 and, you know, 1920, what kind of counsel would you give yeah. to yourself during, during that season? If you were discipling yourself three or four years ago? Yeah, I, I would really just say, you know, take scripture at its word, you know, don't try to, don't try to wiggle your way out of what it's saying, because a lot of what I realized is a lot of it was, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance that I had. So I'd be like, just, you know, try to take off these blinders that you have, uh, try to drop the traditions that you've been grown up uh, with and just look at what scripture is saying and just take it at its word. You know, Mm -hmm. it says it, believe it. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's obviously something that I wouldn't have listened to back then, but if I was dealing with somebody, um, that's going through the same thing that I went through, that that's kind of how I would try to tackle it. Yeah. Um, again, it's weird that eschatology was one of the doorways that I took. Right. Uh, it was kind of a back door into reform theology in a sense, but that's, you know, you just never know what's going to cause something to click. Yeah. Um, right. So that was one of them. Awesome. Well, man, that, this has been a lot of fun. I think uh, you've got a keen eye for legalism today um, because of what you grew up in. I think that's, that's something that you're particularly gifted in. And I think there's a lot of ways where <clears throat> in all circles, they, they can begin to purity spiral. And in these purity, mm-hmm. purity, purity yeah. spirals, one of the things I've talked about is in the patriarchy world or even in the Christian nationalism world, there can be who's in, who's out discussions mm-hmm. based on small secondary or tertiary doctrines and you know whatever those may be there's a danger i think in in for everyone no matter where you're at in saying you know christ alone pursuing christ loving the scriptures wanting to obey him in all of life and then and if you really love him if you're really in you'll do x y or z so just talk about the danger of legalism what why is that such a seductive drug jesus plus something else to be justified to be re- right with god to be in the in crowd and uh you know what are some cautions against that i mean i think you're going to say the scriptures and and you know i don't know exactly but what are some cautions against legalism in the doctrine of justification um but also even with uh the doctrine of sanctification of you know that purity spiral you, you so purity spiral where you sling people out that are are good and godly men and women yeah um, I think, I think a lot of it comes down to, it, it's hard for us to relinquish control as, as humans and, and looking at the finished work of Christ as all that was necessary, uh, to save us. We, we feel like that can't be, that can't be all it took, you know, there has to be something else I'm supposed to be doing. There has to be, you know, some kind of, you know, holiness code that I'm supposed to be following in order to remain saved. You know, a lot, a lot of people in those, those legalistic uh, circles just can't, they don't rest in the assurance. They, they, they are constantly feeling like I'm going to lose my salvation. If I do something wrong this day, that's mm-hmm. it. Then I have to start all over. And it's just like this constant, that's why you see people get baptized like 10 times or, you know, c- constantly going back to the altar to get reconverted. You know, it's, it's just not being able to rest in the finished work of Christ and and the the grace, you know, I had no concept of grace, Hmm. you know, in in growing up, I I didn't have a concept of grace until I started, you know, hearing it in reformed theology, you know, uh, well, what's the documentary American gospel one and two was extremely helpful. And, and watching those, I realized that I had never actually heard the true gospel before, Mm -hmm. you know, and I, I sat there, you know, weeping for hours because I, I had never understood what grace was. So, but a lot, it's really annoying to see it 
to see the legalistic aspects try to creep into reform circles because it's like, oh, I just got out of this. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, it, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to put it into words. Um, it's just really annoying to see it. And I'm, I'm very careful when it comes to that, you know, beca- and it's, it's funny because just with certain convictions, you can make anything legalistic. And I, mm-hmm. I'm, start, I'm starting to see that, you know, like, like you said, with the patriarchy, it, it, you know, what starts is good intention theology and rightfully um, differentiating, you know, men and women's roles and the leadership in the home submission, those things, you know, very good godly doctrines. It's very easy to turn those into um, kind of these le- legalistic ways of living like that a you're putting yeah, you're putting it on to other people. Like if you, this if this doesn't look like my house, or if what you're doing is not looking like what I'm doing, you're sinning somehow. You know, there is a lot of that out there. You know, and it's funny because even with head coverings, you know, and, and I know a lot of people that do the head covering thing, and they do it in a very God honoring way. That can even turn into a you know a, like what you said, like a purity spiral. Like you know, I'm being more obedient than you are because I'm covering my head and you're not. You know, I, I do see some of that, you know, it's not everybody. So anybody that head covers, you know, I'm not talking about, <laughs> you know, there's just a very caveat, caveat, caveat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's the same way. Cause I know a lot can, of people that do. Yeah. And it can be the same thing with eschatology. It can say, it should be the same thing. You know, I just mm-hmm. did a series on this of, you know, you can really bring anything that would be secondary that still is very important. It's not that it's unimportant. It's not that these things are unimportant, but you can bring almost anything into the center and then be legalistic or be rigid about it. And you can do that, you know, with a confession of faith, you know, we are, you know, a full subscriber to this, to the 1689. If you're not a full subscriber, man, you are you're lame. Up. You're, you're lame, <laughs> you're lame. And, uh, you know, same thing with the Westminster standards, you know, or something like that. And, uh, or, you know, if you don't fully buy into, you know, classic covenant theology if you're in the Presby world. These kinds of things yeah. can lead to, and, and we don't want to make the mistake of saying the only thing that matters is the gospel and do the gospel coalition thing, but we also don't want to do the other thing that said, you know, that everything is of equal importance without being able to divide, uh, you know, what is primary, what is secondary kind of thing. But, uh, man, I'm yeah. thankful for you. Yeah, thankful I, for, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I often say, you know, a lot of the guys that tend to go off into these ditches, they would probably do well to spend a couple of years in a fundamentalist holiness cult. They might calm down a little bit, you know? <laughs> uh man that's that's an interesting counsel and you know it drive them nuts but they'd realize oh my gosh this can this gets crazy quick um yeah but uh yeah man i appreciate it and i'm thankful for your time today i think this is going to be helpful and you know for everybody from our church guys thanks so much for listening and and uh you guys already know and love paul and i think those that are uh listening that aren't aren't going to be you know are going to be very helped and encouraged and if you know somebody with a similar background as paul i think those cultish episodes are so helpful for people because Many people know friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, you know, former acquaintances that grew up in similar churches. And then they think in their mind, man, I got to get this episode to them, whoever it may be, to listen to this episode. And just like yourself, you're at work one day listening to an episode on cultish and defecting from Bethel and thinking, oh, man, this is similar. And so if you have people with similar backgrounds as as Paul uh, in your life, you know, shoot this their way. Maybe this is an encouragement and help and you know, why God gets a hold of them in a really good way. So, well, Paul, I appreciate it, man. Um, anything else before we wrap things up? You know, I can't think of anything. Uh, <laughs> you know, we'll, lot, think, think. we'll think of things five minutes from now, you know, be like, oh, we should talk sure. about that. Yeah. That's how it goes. <laughs> well, guys, thanks so much for listening. We've been talking with my good buddy, Paul Rim. Paul, thanks for coming on the show, man. Yeah, thanks, man.